the bar of flies from an open door. Hello, uh, can you hear me? Okay. Okay, so this is twice Ramanujan's and Sparsifiers. This is joint work with uh, Josh Batson and Dan Spielman. And Josh was an undergrad when this was done, and now he's a student at MIT. Okay, so let me begin by uh, defining the problem. So the objective of sparsification is to approximate any given graph G by a sparse graph H for some natural or useful notion of approximation. So what we would like to happen is shown in this picture, you're given a graph G on n vertices, undirected graph, uh, with you know up to n squared edges. And you'd like to find a sparse graph H uh, on the same set of vertices um, with a small number of edges, ideally order n, order n log n edges, so that H is close to G in some rigorous sort of well-defined way. Okay? And uh, we're going to allow the weights of the edges in H to be uh, different and different from their weights in G. Okay? as shown by the sort of varying width of the orange lines here. So uh, why would you want to prove this kind of statement? There are essentially two kinds of reasons. Um, the first is it's just an interesting graph theoretic statement to say that every graph is close to a sparse graph in some sense. And uh, the other kind of reason is more practical, more computational, is that um, H uh, having very few edges is uh, cheaper to store and faster to compute with than G. And if it's close to G in some appropriate sense, it can be used as a proxy for G in computations, and so you can speed up computations. Okay. So um, the first sparsifiers were given by Bengtser and Karger in 1996 for the purpose of finding cuts. And uh, for them, uh, a graph a H approximates G if for every cut S, that is for every subset of the vertices S, uh, the total weight of edges uh, leaving S is approximately equal in uh, G and in H, up to a 1 plus or minus epsilon factor. So what we would like to happen is, you know, for every cut S, that is for every subset of the vertices S, uh, uh, you want uh, the total, the total uh, weight of the edges in G. Um, uh, okay, so you, you want to delete most of the edges, blow up the weights on the remaining edges, so the total weight is approximately the same, and you want this to hold for all, all cuts, for all exponentially many cuts in the graph. Okay? Uh, so Bengtser and Karger showed that um, for any graph G, you can find uh, uh, H with n log n over epsilon squared edges, which preserves all cuts up to a factor of 1 plus minus epsilon. And they showed that you can do this by random sampling in nearly linear time in the number of edges in G. Okay. And uh, this was used to speed up uh, algorithms for all kinds of cut optimization problems, like sparsest cut, min cut. Basically, anything where you care about cuts, H and G are the same, and H is faster. Okay? So the sampling is the obvious sampling. You just sample according to the weight of the edges in G? Uh, no. So you, you, you sample according to some quantity that I find called strong connectivity, which has which is sort of related to the it's related to the um, uh, well, it's it's related to the so the, the, the connectivity of an of an edge is the is the uh, size of the smallest cut that disconnects its endpoints. So strong connectivity is something that comes out of that. It's it's really more related to min cuts than sparse cuts. Okay. Um, so to describe the the notion of sparsification we consider in this work, I'll introduce a matrix associated with the graph, the graph Laplacian, which I'll review quickly here. So the Laplacian L um, is an n by n symmetric matrix whose rows and columns are indexed by the vertices of the graph. It's given by D minus A, where D is a diagonal uh, matrix of the degrees of the vertices, and A is the adjacency matrix. It can also be written as the sum, of, the sum over the edges ij of the graph of outer products delta i minus delta j, delta i minus delta j transpose, where delta i is simply the vector with a 1 in position i and zeros elsewhere. Okay? So what we're really interested in uh, is the quadratic form of the Laplacian, uh, which is defined as follows. So if, if x is a real function on the vertices of the graph, then the quadratic form x transpose lx is simply the sum of uh, differences squared uh, in, uh, in the values of x uh, over the edges. Okay. So it's sum of xi minus xj squared over edges ij, possibly weighted by cij if the, if the edges of the graph are weighted. Okay? So there are basically you know, two things you, uh, you need to know for this for this talk, for starters, which are immediate from this expression. The first is that the Laplacian is positive semi-definite, since this quadratic form is always non-negative, it's a sum of squares. And the second is that the kernel of the Laplacian is exactly the span of the constant vector if the graph g is connected. And to see that, well, if you want this quadratic form to be zero, you need each of you need xi minus xj to be squared to be zero for every edge, and so you need x to be constant across every edge, and you need it to be constant everywhere if the graph is connected. Okay. 
The reason I mentioned this is because you know technically Laplacian is a singular matrix, but um, we know exactly what its kernel, what its null space is. It's the span of the ones vector, and all the vectors we're going to talk about in this talk are orthogonal to this. So I'm going to talk about L inverse in a few places, and that will be okay. Okay. Uh, so returning, uh, you know, again to cuts, um, it turns out that the um, uh, the cut approximation notion of uh, Bankster and Karger can be written cleanly in terms of this quadratic form. So in particular, if, if, I, if I take any cut S and I look at the characteristic vector XS of that cut, and I evaluate the quadratic form at this vector, um, I simply get the total weight of edges crossing the cut. Because uh, the only, the only non-zero terms in the sum are those that correspond to um, edges IJ that have uh, one endpoint inside S and one endpoint outside S. So what Bengtsson Karger is really saying is, um, for every graph G, I can find uh, you know some graph H, so that um, the Laplacian quadratic forms uh, are approximated up to a one plus or minus epsilon on all zero one vectors. Okay. And what the notion of sparsification that we'll pursue in this work is the stronger notion where we insist that this holds for all real vectors and not just zero one vectors. Okay? Is it really strong? It's really it's yeah it's. Yeah. Uh, so here, for general, uh, it, it, it's strictly it's strictly stronger. There are examples. Um, so why would we do this? Um, there are a couple of reasons. Um, first is the quadratic form of a matrix determines its eigenvalues by the Kron Fisher theorem. So if we preserve the quadratic form uh, uh, for all real vectors, um, we are in essence we, we actually preserve all of the eigenvalues. Okay. So you know, by all these theorems and spectral graph theory, H inherits some a lot of uh, properties that have to do with eigenvalues uh, from G. Um, and if we're interested in things like uh, spectral clustering, if we're doing any kind of computations with extremal eigenvectors, H and G are also equivalent in that sense. Okay? Uh, there are a bunch more reasons why the quadratic form is a, a natural thing to approximate. Um, so. Basically, um, it's the natural notion of energy on a graph for uh, any potential x that I define. It, 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 it goes, if, if, if I look at the graph as an electrical circuit, then uh, it gives me exactly the, um, uh, the energy. Uh, if I look at the graph, graph as an electrical circuit and assign electric potentials to the vertices, it exactly gives me the energy of the current flowing in the graph. You uh, you could you could have uh, you could inject and remove current at vertices, mm -hmm. and so then you this would have you would have an electrical flow. So you, could you could no you could choose you could choose uh, vertices. You, right? oh, okay. you could choose one yeah, vertex. Right. You you could. Yeah yeah exactly and it. Yeah. Um, uh, so this governs the behavior of electrical flows. Um, uh, this electrical flows are closely related to random walks on the graph. Um, you know, they determine things like the commute time. They're related. To, uh, the quadratic form is related to the second eigenvalue, which has to do with the mixing time, etc. Um, uh, preserving the quadratic form is also um, the natural notion of approximation for linear operators or in linear algebra. It's the same as the relative condition number, um, and in particular, um, it's a, it's. Uh, uh, um, it's the, it's it's, it's an, it's the notion of approximation used in preconditioning uh, linear systems. So, uh, constructing these sparsifiers is actually a key ingredient in uh, um, design of fast linear system solvers. Yes. So, is there any? What if you just uh, want to approximate, say, the five first eigenvalues? Does that make it? Or you know, some? How you said, okay, when I want to approximate that, I only have the zero one mm -hmm. times. Okay. A sparsifier for the first hundred eigenvalues. Right. So it's no sparsifiers are known for like the top eigenvalue, um, sim but simply because you can get um, uh, there are algorithms for sparsifying matrices uh, additively in the two norm. So this would give this would this would preserve the the top uh, the highest eigenvalues um, for. For top k, I'm not I'm not sure what. Uh, I want like second largest, like mm -hmm. first non-zero eigenvalues. 
Mm-hmm. Um, so, so you're gonna you're gonna get it like in O of N, like you're gonna get it like almost. Uh, My question is: Does that change anything? I mean, or is there a graph that basically approximates one eigenvalue is equal to approximately an order of N? Um, I don't think so. Um, I mean, it's not equivalent. Um, I can, I'm sorry, I can construct a counterexample. Um, yeah, I mean, approximating the, just, just the top eigenvalues would not. Would be weaker. Would be weaker. Would be weaker. Like, if you could find the first pair with much less edges. Yes. Uh, oh, with much less edges? edges um, I mean, no, no sorry. Oh, you cannot find the first pair with much less edges. Right. Yeah, I think, I mean, it's a strictly weaker notion. I'm not sure what the best algorithm for it would be. But it's just with results, and then you can see whether you want to even something even better than this. Or your well, like no, but that, that's a good question. Yeah, I mean, it, yeah. That, that sounds something like doing sparse SVD or something yeah. like that. But the size of the results are going to be optimal, but maybe not this time. Uh, yeah, they're not, they're not very good in time, but um, OK. Um, OK, so having told you why I would uh, want to approximate the quadratic form, let me show you some examples of what uh, graphs that do this look like, what sparse bars look like. So the first example is something uh, everyone has probably seen before, or maybe under a different name. So suppose the graph G that I want to approximate is a complete graph on n vertices. Okay? So it's well known that all the non-zero Laplacian eigenvalues of this are equal to n. And I'm going to approximate this by taking H to be a deregular Ramanujan graph. So Ramanujan graph is a, it's a deregular graph. It's an expander graph. All of its eigenvalues are approximately equal to D. Okay, they're actually. I came for the lecture just because of that word. Okay. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was a Ramanujan graph, the very exact as optimal for a given. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 optimal. It's a, it's a. So you, and I don't know any construction of those except to number theory. So. Uh -huh. So you're not going to be making a new construction even even of those. Um. They're not, not exactly the same, but we will, we will construct sparse weighted graphs, which basically achieve this, uh, basically so achieve this amount. Yes. So, 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 so I'm arguing with about the definition. Now. Yeah, <laughs> this is not, this, this is definitely not asymptotics, actually. This is just say, actually, the eigenvalues of H are exactly between D plus uh, d minus 2 squared, d minus 1, and d plus 2 squared. You cannot argue with him because he puts a tilde. We know that's <laughs> what I said. What does that mean? Yeah. Well, you know what? It means they're like around d. They're actually plus, <laughs> uh, yeah. So, um, so in particular, what that means is if I, if I take my Ramanujan graph and I, uh, I multiply it by n over d, that is, I blow up all the edge weights by n over d, all the eigenvalues are now around n. And so now this ratio is something that's basically around 1, because the numerator is something that's close to n. The denominator is, is exactly n, and so this thing is 1. So uh, what I want you to take away from this slide is that expanders, particularly Ramanujan graphs, are very good, are good sparsifiers for the complete graph. Okay? Uh, the second example, only slightly more complicated, is a dumbbell graph. This consists of two copies of the complete graph joined by a single edge. And uh, uh, it, I can approximate this by taking two copies of my deregular Ramanujan graph with edge weights blown up by n over d, uh, connected by a single edge. And the reason this works is because um, the quadratic form is linear in the matrix. So the, uh, the sum of the sparsifiers is the sparsifier of the sums. So I can approximate this left half by an expander, right half by an expander, edge by itself. And I get uh, an approximation for the whole graph. Uh, key things to note about this example are the weights of edges are different. Um, so the weight, the edges in here have weight n over d, whereas the edge in the middle has weight 1. You can prove that this is actually necessary. And the other thing is um, any sparsifier for this dumbbell must include the center edge. So any algorithm that does this has to, well, at least figure out that you need to include that edge in the center. Okay. So the point is for some graph, even unweighted, you would need this. You want yes. to sparsify, you need weights. Yes. So this is an example of an unweighted graph for which you need weights to uh, approximate it well. Okay. Yeah? The number of non-zeros is small. Oh, okay. As far as I mean, number of non-zeros is, is very small. Yeah. So I'll now present our results. And uh, basically what we showed is, in the, the two examples I just showed you about approximating a complete graph by a Ramanujan graph um, and a dumbbell by the, that other graph, uh, basically what we proved is we can, we can do this with exactly the same bounds for any, any weighted undirected graph G. 
um, up to a factor of two, okay? Uh, hence the title twice Ramanujan. Specifically, um, one way to introduce this result is uh, this is previously known that um, uh, Ramanujan graphs exist or their expander graphs exist. And this is simply the statement is that there, there are very sparse graphs H that look like the complete graph, okay? Spectrally. Um, in particular, there are degree D graphs um, for which uh, the Laplacian quadratic form of the graph is within d plus or minus 2 squared d minus 1 of that of the complete graph. Okay? What we show in this work is that there are very sparse graphs that look like any graph G that you give me. So um, by very sparse, now I mean average degree 2D. So instead of degree D, I now have twice as many edges, average degree 2D. This is no longer regular. It just has average degree 2D, not exact degree 2D. Um, and Yes, for any graph G that you give me, I can find um, a graph H which approximates its quadratic form just as well. Uh, the H that I construct is going to be a weighted subgraph of G, which means that its edge set is going to be a subset of the edges of G, but the weights are possibly going to be different. And I'm going to show you a deterministic polynomial time algorithm for constructing this graph. So let's H. see. So, the, so you are, it's just a factor of two, and then it's just completely sharp. Uh, so yeah, it's completely it's sharp. Yeah, assuming you're allowed to have edge weights, which yeah. is a lot of freedom. But yeah, it's completely sharp. Okay. But, but it's average degree. Yeah. It's, it's average degree to the, yeah. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, you, you need average degree for approximating general graphs. So. Okay, so ways to look at uh, what this, uh, this work, uh, what's new about this. Um, you can see it as a generalization of uh, expander graphs, which are approximations of the complete graph. Uh, because the algorithm is deterministic, it gives it explicit construction of expander graphs. So they don't share all the same properties as the previous constructions of Ramanujan graphs. In particular, they're weighted. Um, it improves previous work uh, with Dan Spielman from 2008 and by Bengtsson and Carter from 1996, uh, which showed how to construct um, cut sparse fires and spectral sparse fires with dn log n edges. So you can see this as removing the log n. And it's also the first deterministic algorithm of any kind for sparsification of any kind. Mm -hmm. You're not going to get back an unweighted. I mean, I mean you're not going to get back an unweighted. You have with another G. You're going to get something. You're you're going to get something uh, which whose weighted degrees are regular, but the individual edge weights are going to be. I mean, no guarantee on what those are. And you don't know how that would look like necessarily. No, I mean, you can put prove some bounds on them, but they're not they're not going to be like the same or anything. Okay. Okay. So. I'm going to show you um, the proof of this theorem, which is elementary and just linear algebra, and I can fit well, it in this talk. And uh, for simplicity, I'm going to show you how to, for any graph G, find a weighted, uh, sparse uh, weighted subgraph H with six n edges, which achieves a 13 approximation to the quadratic form, OK? Um, just for simplicity. This can all be tightened to give the bounds for the, the Ramanujan bound, OK? So I'm going to start by reducing this uh, graph sparsification problem to a fairly clean and I think like natural statement in linear algebra. And then the rest of the stock is just going to be proving that linear algebra stick. OK, so recall that this is what we wanted to do. Uh, we were given G. We want to select a small subset of edges uh, in such a way that the quadratic form is approximated up to 13. OK? Uh, so let's recall the outer product expansion for the Laplacian of G. Uh, so I'm writing it as a sum of these outer products uh, over edges i, j, and e. Uh, and let me let me rename these vectors. Let me re-index. Let, let me re-index these vectors instead of i, j. Let me call the edges e. So this is sum of b, e, b, e transpose for some vectors b, e. Okay. Now the nice thing about this expansion is that if h is a weighted subgraph of G, that is if the uh, the edges of H are simply basically reweighted version of the edges of, of G, then the Laplacian of H um, has the same outer product expansion but with weights SE, where SE is the weight of edge E and H. Okay? So if H is sparse, most of the SEs are going to be 0, and uh, the remaining SEs are going to be whatever the weight is in H. Okay? So with this, uh, with this fact in hand, uh, I, can bring, I can begin, uh, you know, um, um, I can begin uh, rewriting this in, in sort of a, in a more appealing form. So this is what we want to prove. Um, 
uh, multiplying on the left and right by the square root of the inverse of the Laplacian of G, we see that this is equivalent to showing that all the eigenvalues of LG to the minus 1 half, LH, LG to the minus 1 half are between 1 and 13. Okay? Um, opening this H in the middle with this outer product thing that I showed you on the last slide, we get that um, we want to show the eigenvalues of this sum of, um, of uh, outer products of vectors. We want to show the eigenvalues are between 1 and 13. So and that is any one of the eigenvalues. Yeah, all, all the eigenvalues. And, uh, and letting VE denote um, uh, LG to the minus half BE, which is the term that appears in the sum, we see that we simply want to show that, a, that there exists a set of scalars SE, sparse, so that um, this weighted sum of outer products has eigenvalues between 1 and 13. Okay? So you are, still, you are going to assume something about the VEs? Yeah, I'm about, to, I'm about to show you what, I'm, uh, what I can assume about the VEs from the fact that G is a graph. Okay? So, so this is the goal. Find a sparse set of scalars SE so that these eigenvalues are, are good. Okay? Uh, let me take a closer look at what the VEs are. Um, so the VEs are m vectors in Rn minus 1. So they're m vectors, one for each edge. It's an Rn minus 1 because the vectors are in the image of the square root of the inverse of the Laplacian, which is n minus 1, rank n minus 1. And so you know, I'm thinking of my graph G as m vectors. Okay? Now the, the crucial property of these VEs is um, that they form a decomposition of the identity, um, in the sense that the sum of projections onto the VEs is equal to the identity, simply by definition. Okay? Um, I assume I'm assuming the graph's connected, yes. Okay. Um, so just from the fact that G is a graph, I get that the sum of, I get that these VEs are a decomposition of the identity, like, um, uh, and, uh, you know, more concrete way of looking at this is that um, the moment ellipse of, of these vectors is, is the sphere. So all, their eigen, all the eigenvalues are one because it's the identity. So for any unit vector U, if I look at the sum of projections squared of u onto my vectors ve, I get one. Okay, so I look in any direction, I get total projection one. So this is like uh, you sort of reducing it to the uh, stratification of the complete graph, but this is given. In Which is the identity already? The identity yes. Already. So that's yes. Uh, okay. okay, so let's return now to what we were doing. We want we wanted to choose. Um, Sorry, just to complete my question. Uh huh. You can only use edges from the given edges, um, and and I guess you know a little less about what the vectors are, but but yes. And these, uh, this configuration in Rn to be three is huge. Is it? Yeah. Well, I mean, all we know about it is that its eigenvalues are one. But um, yeah, the lengths of the vectors could be you know uh, all kinds of stuff. Um, so our goal was to. Um, uh, so okay, so cho choosing a sparse subgraph of G will now correspond to choosing a small subset of the vectors VE and possibly stretching them by some scalars SE. Okay? And it turns out that our approximation guarantee of um, wanting, you know, the approximation guarantee that we wanted of having all the eigenvalues uh, um, of, uh, of, of SE, uh, of all the eigenvalues of this, of this uh, Sub of the subset uh, between one and thirteen. Um, uh, yeah. So, this, so, so, so right. So, 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 so this is um, so essentially the, the problem reduces to this. You're, you're you're given a decomposition identity. You want to select a small part which has which is well conditioned. Okay. Yes. Yes. So now, uh, on the theorem set, you just need n log n. Yeah. So there's a there's a concentration result that says if you take n log n random samples, you just get this. Really yeah. Which is what led to the previous n log n sparsification result. Um, I see. Did they phrase it exactly like this? Because this seems. Did did the Spearman Sank paper have this kind of um, phrasing? That it's just oh, 
Well, I mean, I mean, yeah, basically. Is that like we, I mean, at, uh, I mean, all basically what was being done in that paper was just this reduction. And there was some efficient method for computing the sampling probabilities, but yeah, I mean, if you, it's true that if I if I if I'm given a decomposition of identity, if I randomly sample n log n vectors with probability proportional to the lengths, I get something which is close to the identity. So that would give me a n log n sparse effect. Okay. Okay. So, just to recap what I've done in this section, I've reduced the goal of sparsifying graphs to approximating the identity, to finding sparse approximations of the identity. Okay. In particular, I've reduced what I want to do to proving the following theorem. So if I can prove this theorem, I'm done. Um, so I would like to sh show that given any um, decomposition of the identity, there is a sparse set of scalars at most 6n, um, so that uh, uh, so that, um, so that, so, so, right. Given a decomposition identity, there's uh, I, I, I can choose a sparse subset, possibly with scaling, so that uh, the I get something that's approx 13 approximately the identity. Okay. Um, in the paper, we actually proved this with bounds uh, like the Ramanujan bounds that, for, you know, for any such set of vectors, I can choose d n, which get this bound. But in this talk, I'll just show you the 6 n and 13 for simplicity. Um, I'm sorry. Um, uh, well, so D n is average degree two D. Right? Oh, right. Yeah. So, yeah. D. N. Okay. So we we get D n vectors and we get this D plus or minus two square D minus one. The point is that D n corresponds to average degree two D. D n edges means average degree two D. Okay. Um, so, okay, so I'll give you some um, intuition for the proof. So this is the theorem we want to show. Essentially, the strategy is we're going to build, we're going to build our approximation step by step. We're going to start with the zero, uh, empty zero matrix. And at every step, we're going to add some rank one matrix. Uh, um, that is, we're going to set some SE to some non-zero value. And we're going to do this in a manner that the eigenvalues are controlled. And at the end, we're going to end up in a situation where they're all between 1 and 13. Okay? Yes, this can be thought of as a, as a derandomization of Rudelson's lemma. No, but Rudelson requires n log n. So where is the six? Uh, the s well, we we got rid of the n log n. Right. No, oh, but, but, but how can it be a derandomization of Rudelson? Because that requires n log n. But maybe the weighting function is multiplied. The, the weighting is different. The weighting the weighting is co completely is so quite different from. No, Rudelson. Rudelson is. Uh, yeah, Rudelson is. Um, well, in Rudelson, you you reweight vectors by one over their norm, but basically that's the weighting. In this, actually, the weighting is completely different. So. so you can't think of it as a derandomization. Um, I mean, I'm. I guess it. I'm. I'm not sure what you mean by derandomization. Well, it's. So the log n is because of coupon collector. Yeah. The, low, the lower bound for the lower bound for the log n comes from basically coupon collector. So if you do conditional expectation to something that has coupon collector, that will like disappear. Maybe, maybe. In some like I mean, in some trivial settings, you could probably come up with examples like that. Okay. So yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure what I see why. Okay. Okay, we'll see that. Okay. So. Uh, so, so the, the fundamental question that we need to answer before we start doing this is, what happens when you what happens to the eigenvalues of a matrix when you add uh, uh, a projection onto a vector when you add a rank one matrix to it? Okay. So the answer to this question is well known. So suppose my matrix A has eigenvalues shown by these blue dots on this line, uh, and suppose I add some VV transpose to A. Well, what happens to the eigenvalues is they all shift forward in a manner that the new eigenvalues interlace the old ones. That is, they alternate with the old ones. Okay. Um, in fact, we can get much more precise information about exactly where the new eigenvalues lie by looking at the characteristic polynomial of um, the matrix. So the characteristic polynomial of A is determinant xi minus A. Uh, there's a well-known formula in linear algebra for um, uh, uh, which tells us exactly what happens to the determinant when I add a rank one matrix. Okay. So using this, I can calculate the characteristic polynomial of A plus VV transpose, which is simply the characteristic polynomial of A times 
uh, this quantity 1 plus sum over i, which are the eigenvalues. Uh, the numerator is the projection of my vector v onto the eigenvector ui squared. And the denominator is simply lambda i minus x. Okay. Uh, yeah, um, that, that can be, that can, um, well, well, it is, because these are, you divide, because PA has, is a product of lambda i minus x, so it's a polynomial. Okay. PA is what? So PA has roots lambda i, right? So, uh, so what, right. And the, and the eigenvalues of the new matrix are, in fact, roots of this, uh, this thing. Uh, on the right hand side. So okay. UI are the eigenvectors. UI are the eigenvectors. UI are the eigenvectors of A. Lambda are the eigenvalues of A. V is a vector being added. And um, uh, this is uh, the new characteristic polynomial. So this yeah. does not depend on the fact that A has the, uh, you know, whether A is true or not. It doesn't depend, yeah. It doesn't. Okay. Um, so this equation uh, actually leads to. Uh, of a physical model for what happens to the eigenvalues when I add a vector. Uh, and this physical model will give us a little more intuition, and the physical model is this. So um, I have a matrix A. Um, the real line is a slope. Um, uh, it's like an inclined plane. And the eigenvalues are positive unit charges resting at the, some massless, chargeless barriers on this slope. Okay? So we have eigenvalues lambda 1 through lambda n, and they're all sitting snugly against these barriers at, at wherever they're located. Okay? And when I add a vector v, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add charges to the barriers. And the charge added to the barrier for um, uh, the ith eigenvalue is simply going to be the projection of the vector v onto the ith eigenvector squared. Okay, um, okay so I, have, I had these charges sitting against barriers. I've now added charges to the barriers depending on the projections of the new vector. And, uh, now there are a bunch of charged particles sitting around, and they're going to repel each other. So you know, I had some projection onto my first barrier. This is going to push my first eigenvalue up. I, pr I also had some uh, projection on the second barrier. This is going to re repel it down. Gravity is also kind of there in this whole process. Um, uh, the second barrier is going to push my second eigenvalue up, which might repel the third eigenvalue a little to the right as well. Okay. Um, and so this is where the new eigenvalues rest. So to give you a better idea of how this works, I'll show you a couple of examples. Um, in the first one, suppose I had a vector which has all of its projection on the first eigenvector. Okay? So I'm going to add all my charge on the first barrier, lambda, on the first barrier next to lambda 1. And uh, this is quite a lot of charge. So this is going to push my eigenvalue almost all the way up to the second barrier, which is going to push my second eigenvalue up, which might even push my third eigenvalue up. Okay? So the thing to note here is that I've, I've added a vector which had projection only on one eigenvector, and yet it's, it's influenced a whole bunch of eigenvalues. Okay? These are the eigenvalues that you make. If you have projection on only one eigenvector, then you're adding Camus to all these eigenvectors, which means that you're shifting this eigenvalue by one if you're not saying anything else. Uh, so actually, you, you are changing. You are. Oh, okay. You, 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 can, you can think of this as, okay, so if you want, you can think of this as this eigenvalue ends up here, this eigenvalue ends up here, and some other eigenvalue ends up there. No, 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 why would the other smoke? Why would the other smoke? Only one, one change, the other is the same. Right. Well, so the, the actual eigenvalues that I, okay, so I think there's some confusion about the, the identities of these eigenvalues. So the point is, before I started, I had an eigenvalue here, right? After I started, I had an eigenvalue here. It's actually at the same place. So I, I have, uh, I mean, I can think of this as this eigenvalue stayed still, this eigenvalue stayed still, and this eigenvalue moved up there. Something like that. Yeah, but in this picture, how do you know when it stopped? Oh, okay. Well, there's some equilibrium that comes out of that equation. So, so, so actually, yes. Actually, this eigenvalue did not move because there was an eigenvalue here. I'm, I'm thinking of it as having moved here, but really, it moved there because this eigenvalue ended up here. 
So this eigen, there, there's still an eigenvalue here, there's an eigenvalue here, and now there's an eigenvalue somewhere else, which is what happened from adding to this projection. Yeah, but anyway, Martin is right. In this example, only one eigenvalue will really change. You can depict it any way you like. OK, that's true. OK, uh, fine. You can also think of this as just these eigenvalues are here, and this eigenvalue just hopped over there. You can also, OK, that's true. OK, I, I see your point. <laughs> Yeah, oh, okay. Um, right. Okay, yeah, okay. So so my remark about other eigenvalues moving was only for the sake of this model. That's, you're right, it's obviously not true. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, um, another example is when I add a vector that has, say, equal weight on the, on the first two, um, um, two eigenvectors. And in this case, um, my first eigenvalue will move forward, but not too far because it will be repelled backwards by the charge I'm putting on the second barrier. And uh, this, will move, um, this will move the, uh, the second barrier will repel the, the, the second eigenvector forward and third eigenvector forward, and so as on. Before, only two will move. As before, only two will move because this, this will end up at the, at the same place. OK, okay maybe I'm, I'm indulging this physical model a little, a little too much, but OK. And the third example um, is if I add equal weight to all of the barriers, um, then what I expect roughly is that the eigenvalues will drift forward in some, some steady kind of manner. Okay? Um, and I'm particularly interested in this case when I add um, equal projection on all the eigenvectors because it has to do with what happens when you add a random vector. In any case, I can quantify this drift in eigenvalues more precisely, again, by looking at the characteristic polynomial. So if I add a vector which has the same projection on all the eigenvectors, let's just say it's 1 for now, then I'm just going to update the polynomial by 1 plus sum of 1 over lambda i minus x, because all the projections are 1. And the, this is just going to be the same as subtracting um, uh, the derivative of the polynomial from itself. Um, because you know the polynomial is a product of lambda i minus of, of like x minus lambda i, and this is negative of the derivative. Okay. So, with this knowledge in hand, um, I can I can start looking at what happens when I add. I mean, this is this is just giving intuition for the proof. To start looking at what happens when I add a, a random vector from my collection ve, which is a decomposition of the identity. So. The point is that for every eigenvector ui, the sum of projections onto e is equal to 1, uh, because all the eigenvalues are 1. Uh, so in particular, um, the, if I pick a random vector, the expected projection on any eigenvector is equal to 1 over m. Okay? Um, now, suppose m is the total number of edges in the original graph. Okay? So, so I don't mean, so none of the actual vectors will actually have this property. They have the same projection on all the eigenvectors. But if I look at the expected vector, or I look at, I look at the expected projection on, all the, on each eigenvector, it's going to be 1 over m. Okay? Yeah, so here it's important that That's very important. The sum, the, the, the sum, the, the, the that they, they add up to the identity, yes. This is, it would be obvious for a random vector, which is really complicated. Right. Yes. Yeah. OK. Um, so now. This is what my ideal proof is going to look like. Um, this is complete. This is not rigorous. So I'm going to start off with uh, an empty matrix zero. All its eigenvalues are at zero, and the characteristic polynomial is just x to the n. And suppose I can add this like ideal random vector. I can actually find this vector which has same projection on all the eigenvalues, on all the eigenvectors at each step. Okay. Well, you know, first step I'm going to get some non-zero eigenvalue. The characteristic polynomial is uh, going to, you know. You're going to subtract off the derivative. You're going to, it's going to evolve in this manner. Uh, keep doing this. Uh, keep, uh, keep adding um, this you know, ideal vector that has the same projection on all the eigenvectors. And I'm going to get a, se a series of characteristic polynomials that are generated by this process of subtracting the derivative. Okay? And I, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing, you know, I'm hoping that the eigenvalues are going to drift off in some nice way. And eventually, when I, get, when I do this for a really long time, eventually they're going to be 
close to each other, and the ratio is actually going to is going to be like some constant, like 13. Okay. So actually, something much better is true. Um, this process for generating polynomials of picking a polynomial and subtracting its derivative generates a classical family of orthogonal polynomials called the associated Laguerre polynomials. And everything is known about the roots of these polynomials. And if I do this for dn steps, I actually get exactly this ratio. So if I was able to get this ideal vector behavior after dn steps, I'd be done. Okay? And so re really what we want to do in the proof is to find actual vectors that realize this behavior of having the same projection on every um, eigenvector. And to, th to do this, we'll need to, this is where we'll need to introduce weights. So, yeah, I'm, I'm actually, um, so this is actually not tight. I'm just doing this for simplification. Actually, the bound I get is d plus 1 plus 2 square root d, over d plus 1 minus 2 square root d, which is better than this. But, well, I'm pointing but out it, yeah. come up with a relevant family of orthogonal polynomials, mm -hmm. so I'm telling you that in the construction of a, of a perfect expander, which is a, a infinite tree, tree. Oh, the Chebyshev polynomial. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. uh, this is essentially, in, I think, our long number of time attributes. The Laguerre polynomial? Uh, well, or something? The Chebyshev polynomial. Okay. <laughs> okay, so what we have to do now is find actual vectors that realize this behavior. Okay? So now, again, forget about this Ramanujan and bound. We'll try to do 6n vectors with 13 approximation. Um, the proof, at a high level, the proof is going to go as follows. I'm going to, I'm going to, have, um, I'm going to have an iterative process. I'm going to start with the empty matrix, all of whose eigenvalues are at 0. Uh, I'm going to keep track of two real numbers called barriers. There's going to be a lower barrier, which is initially going to be minus n, and an upper barrier, which is going to be n. And I'm going to maintain the invariant that at, at every point in this process, all the eigenvalues are between the barriers. Okay? And in each step, in one step of the process, I'm going to do the following. I'm going to find a vector to add from my collection, possibly with some scaling. This is going to shift the eigenvalues forward. And I'm going to guarantee that I've chosen a vector that shifts the eigenvalues in a manner that I can now shift the barriers by constants, fixed constants, so that the eigenvalues are between the new barriers. Okay? So this is what one step looks like. Add a vector, shift the barriers. Lower barrier by a third, upper barrier by two. The reasons for this will become clear later. Okay. So I start at minus n and n, and I do this. Now, one thing to note in each step of this process is that when I shift the lower barrier forward, I'm tightening the constraint on the eigenvalues. I'm asking the eigenvalues to be bigger. Okay? Whereas when I shift the upper barrier forward, I'm actually uh, loosening the constraint. Because uh, I, want, I want the eigenvalues to be less than the upper barrier, and if I shift it forward, it's, it's actually easier. Okay? So shifting the lower barrier will, will make sure that the eigenvalues drift forward at a, steady, at a good enough pace. And the upper barrier, while it's also moving forward, will be moving slowly enough so that uh, the eigenvalues don't get too big. Okay? Okay, so if I do this process for a while, um, always maintaining the invariant that the eigenvalues are between the barriers, you know, I, I do this uh, for 6 n steps. Um, eventually, my lower barrier is going to be at n, and my upper barrier is going to be at 13n, uh, because I incremented by a third and by two. And at the end, my eigenvalues are going to have ratio, uh, are going to be between 13n and n, so the, the ratio is going to be almost 13. Okay? And I'll be done. So the whole thing that we have to prove here is that at every step, there is an appropriate vector to add. And the problem is right now our induction hypothesis, our invariant, which is just that the eigenvalues lie between the barriers, is not strong enough to prove this claim. It's not strong enough to do the induction. Okay? Um, so we, we'll, we'll need a more delicate way to measure the quality of the eigenvalues of a matrix that takes into account sort of the whole distribution of eigenvalues instead of just asking whether the max is less than something or the min is greater than something. Okay? Now the correct way to do this, or not the correct one way to do this that works, which came out of, which has something to do with that physical model also, 
is to use uh, potential functions. Okay, so I'm interested in I'm interested in the eigenvalues of my matrix being not too big and not too small. Let's worry about the not too big for now. So um, I'm gonna I'm gonna ensure this by using this upper potential function um, phi superscript u of a, where u is the upper barrier, which is given by trace of u i minus a inverse. Okay. So this is simply the sum of the reciprocals of the distances of the eigenvalues from u. Okay. Um, now it's clear from this form that uh, this function blows up as any of the eigenvalues approaches u. Okay. So if I have all my eigenvalues on the right side, and I know that this potential is bounded by one, let's say, then I know that none of the eigenvalues are close to the barrier. Okay. But actually, I know a lot more. I know that there's no eigenvalue within distance one. There are no two eigenvalues within distance two. There are no three eigenvalues within distance three, et cetera. Okay. So actually, I know that this whole distribution of eigenvalues is well behaved with respect to this barrier. Okay. Um, if you're following that physical model, you can think of this upper potential as just being the total repulsion. Okay. Okay. Similarly, I can define a lower barrier, uh, uh, phi sub L of A, which is trace of A minus Li inverse which is keeping track of distances from L. And this also blows up as any of the eigenvalues approaches L from above. Okay. Now it turns out that uh, this is a strong enough uh, invariant to maintain to make this proof work. So in the beginning, I have my empty matrix. I have my barrier at minus n and n. My upper potential is equal to 1. All the eigenvalues are distance n uh, from, uh, from 1 and there are n of them. So the upper potential is 1. The lower potential is 1. So my, my potentials are bounded by one. And now I can actually prove this lemma that um, if, my, if, my, if my potentials are bounded by one, then I can, I can always choose some multiple of some vector to add so that both potentials do not increase when I shift the barriers by a third and two, okay? And if I can prove this lemma, then you know, I can do this and I can finish the proof, okay? So all I need to do now is prove this lemma, okay? Um, so notice that I now have a stronger assumption than I had before. Before I just had the eigenvalues are between the barriers. Now I know both the potentials are bounded. Can you explain that last one? Why do you get approximation? Yeah. The Here? Barriers don't shift. Okay. So if I can prove that, okay. So I started off with my upper and lower potentials bounded by one, right? If I can prove this lemma that any time my upper and lower potentials are bounded by one, I can find a vector to add. That allows me to shift the barrier. That's a lemma. Okay. So then, because I started at minus so n this and this new potential will be for a plus s v v. Yes. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, then, then uh, if I can prove I can make such a step, then that means, well, that means I can take steps keeping the eigenvalues between these barriers. And in particular, if I can prove it for these parameters of one plus one third and plus two for the shifting. Then after six n steps, my barriers will be at n and thirteen n. So the point is that this this is the stronger uh, inductive assumption. In particular, if it implies that they remain between the boundaries, and if they end up between you know n and thirteen n, then that's what you want. Yeah. And we then increase the barriers by some constant. So both barriers increase. Then. No. So uh, what I'm uh, what I'm not seeing is what was missing from the previous the previous value. So. Yeah, so oh, yeah. you you could you could not prove this lemma for the trivial. That's the, the only, you just needed a stronger inductive hypothesis to okay. So now we're just going to prove this lemma and that will finish the proof of the theorem, okay? So um, you know, we're looking for a vector to add, okay? So the first question you ask is which vector should we add? But actually the right question to ask is given a fixed vector, how much of it can we add? Uh, basically, what is the right scaling that would allow me to um, say not increase the upper potential? Okay. So, so let's focus on the upper barrier for now. Okay. So suppose I'm I have a matrix A. The upper barrier is at U, and I'm interested in adding some multiple of a vector v. So I'm interested in acting S V V transpose. Okay. So I'm asking the question: How much? How what? What value? Can, what values can S have so that this upper potential does not increase with the shift? Okay. So okay, my upper uh, my upper potential at the shifted barrier of the updated matrix is this thing. Um, 
which is this trace of u prime i minus a minus SVV transpose, uh, transpose inverse. And now I can exactly compute how this relates um, to what my potential was before using the Sherman Morrison formula, which is just this is a basic linear algebra fact, which says what happens to the inverse of a matrix under rank one updates. So using this formula, I get that the updated pot potential, the, 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 the potential at the shifted barrier of the updated matrix is the same as the potential at the shifted barrier of the old matrix, plus some quantity here, which is the numerator of the quadratic form in V. Denominator is one over S minus some quadratic form in V, okay? And what did I want to do? I wanted to, um, you know, uh, add the add a vector so that this potential is at most the potential before shifting of the old matrix. Okay, so basically, I want this inequality here, and I can just I can just rearrange things and see exactly what the condition is on S for which that inequality holds. Okay, so it turns out to be this: um, I can add S times VV transpose when one over S is at least some quadratic form in V. Okay, we'll look at this quantity later. The point is that this lower bound on 1 over s, this lower constraint, is linear in VV transpose. Okay? It's some matrix dot product VV transpose. Um, the direction of this inequality makes sense because a lower bound on 1 over s is an upper bound on s. So it's saying I can't add more than a certain amount of you know, this vector because it would blow up the eigenvalues too much. So I can repeat the same calculation for the lower barrier, and I basically get something very similar. I get an upper bound on 1 over s, which is also linear in VV transpose. Okay. Now, the question of finding a vector which allows us to shift both barriers now reduces to finding a vector for which um, uh, the lower bound on 1 over s is less than the upper bound on 1 over s. Okay. So if I can find a vector for which this, this quantity ua dot VV transpose is at most la dot VV transpose, then I'm done because I can squeeze the scaling factor 1 over s in between. Okay? This is where the weights come from. So I'm going to prove that this happens just by taking the sum. I'm going to show the sum of the uh, left-hand side is less than the sum of the right-hand side. So I take the sum of the left-hand side. I have the sum of ua dot VV transpose over all the vectors. Now this is where the linearity comes in. I can move the sum inside the dot product. And I get this sum of VEV transpose, which I know is the identity. So this is basically the other place where I'm using this fact. I'm only using this fact in two places. Actually, I'm only using this fact in one place in this proof, and this is it. OK? This would be a left. Oh, you are just computing it on the left. Yes, just on the left. OK? So that's just equal to the trace of this matrix UA. Okay? The trace of this matrix, now, we can look at closely and bound very nicely using the inductive hypothesis. So the second term here. If you'll notice, it's simply the potential at the shifted barrier of the old matrix, which we know is less than the potential before shifting at the old matrix, because shifting the upper barrier forward um, reduces the potential uh, if you're not changing the matrix. And by induction, this is at most 1. Okay. The quantity on the, the other term, uh, the numerator is just actually the derivative of the barrier function with respect to the barrier. Okay. And the denominator is, if you'll notice, it's just the difference in uh, it's a difference in the upper potential when I shift the barrier. So by convexity, this can be lower bounded by the shift in the barrier times the derivative. Okay. So the derivatives cancel, and basically I get a quantity that only depends on the shift in the barrier. It doesn't depend on the matrix A. It doesn't uh, it doesn't actually even depend on the barrier. It just depends on the shift in the barrier. Okay. Delta U is like one term. Delta, Delta U is two, actually, for the upper barrier. Oh, the upper barrier. Okay. So, okay. So, what this means is that the left hand side of this is bounded by one over Delta U plus one. I can repeat essentially the same computation, get that the right hand side is at least one over Delta L plus one, minus one. And these ones come from the induction hypothesis. Okay. So, you need that there. And now it becomes clear why I'm setting the upper shift to two and the lower shift to a third, because two is greater than three hours, and that's it. So that completes the proof of the theorem. Um, to okay, so this right. So, so so all the weights come from this one over s uh, thing here, right? Uh, the problem is the way. Okay, so you can get some bounds on one over s, 
The problem is right now there's uh, uh, we're um, uh, we're essentially adding vectors with replacement because every time we do this we're averaging over all the vectors. Okay, so you may add a vector many many times, and we actually have no control on what the weight is at the end. Um, I mean, no no additional control over what the weight is at the end. Okay. Okay, so that finishes the proof of the theorem. If anybody wants to see any more of that. How do you find these? Oh, you go over all, the over all the vectors. Right. So these UA. What's the complexity result in the end? I mean, one is cons the existence, the other is. Yeah, it's slow. So you have to go over all the vectors, they're m vectors. Uh, you have to compute this matrix UA. So you have to invert some stuff for that. That takes n cubed time. And there are dn steps. So it's dn m cubed, so it's really slow. It's polynomial time. It's polynomial time. dn n cubed. Yeah. I mean, there, you could do some tricks to speed it up a little bit, but basically it's slow. So there's no hope to get from this uh, like a strongly explicit graph where you can compute the neighbors of an edge? Uh... Uh, n not as it's not really. So we spent a lot of time trying to get control on the weights. I mean, it seems at the least you'd need to get some control on the weights for that, right? No, I mean, the, it, it's not clear for many. It was yeah, it's not clear whether it exists. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, so. Um, but basically, yeah, we know very little about what kind of graphs this generates other than their eigenvalues are in the right place. Did you come with more on the spec group too? Is it more fundamental? I mean, you twice or? Um, right. So these numbers are not fundamental. Oh, the factor of two in the Ramanujan? Um, is that really coming from this Laguerre polynomial? Yes, that's coming from the Laguerre polynomial. So, so yeah, I mean, to finish, actually, to finish the proof, you, you just tighten everything up with Laguerre polynomials, and you get this bound. And the factor of 2 is coming from the Laguerre polynomials. Um, I mean, essentially, what we did in this proof, like in, the, in this step when we took averages, what's really going on under the hood is saying, yes, we can behave as if we're adding vectors that have the same projection onto all the eigenvectors. Um, if we're allowed to use weights, we, can, we, we are exactly in that scenario. And so we get exactly the, the bounds from the Laguerre polynomials. In fact, this is an alternative proof for why the roots of the Laguerre polynomials are in this ratio. Okay. Uh, so there are some extensions to this. So I mentioned, I guess I'm running out of time. I mentioned very briefly. Well, you have many questions, so you can email. Okay. <laughs> um, so this is a theorem we proved. And one natural thing to try to do is to see if you can prove some theorem like this uh, with weights that are 0, 1, uh, without weights. Okay. So we tried a lot to do this. Uh, and it seems hard. And actually, it's if we could do that, it would solve a major open problem in like linear algebra and analysis. It's called the Cadison Singer conjecture. So if you can prove that given um, if you can prove that given decomposition of the identity, you can find zero one weights so that uh, you you get a subcollection with eigenvalues between any two constants, actually. This would solve like a very long standing open problem. Uh, so subjection being an interval? Um, yeah, yeah. Interval? So so this really the way you should think of this is the question is, can you partition uh, a decomposition identity into two sets, which are approximately, which are well conditioned? I mean, these kind of conjectures probably are false. I don't see too much happen. Um, so with uh, variance on this will be uh, with uh, some cons conjecture, have been shown to be false. So mm -hmm. We're using expense. Uh huh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so here, there's no condition on sparsity. I mean, they couldn't be all one, right? Uh, well, that wouldn't work because then you, I mean, you know, then the top eigenvalue would be one. It's really about partition. Oh, okay. It's, it's just can you partition? And actually, there's a condition that the vectors need to be short enough. Like you can't do this with an orthonormal basis, but since the vectors are less than some constant, can you do this? Um, so we're not able to prove this or disprove this, but we were able to recover the best known result about this so far, which is a restricted invertibility theorem of Bourgain and Safiri, um, which is the following statement, uh, just linear algebraic statement. Which is, so if T is a linear operator uh, in Rn, so T is an n by n matrix, and its columns have norm 1, uh, then there's a subset of the columns of size um, at least n, basically constant times n divided by the norm of the matrix. 
uh, so that uh, the restriction of the operator to these columns is well conditioned. Okay, so the eigenvalue is at least a constant. Okay, um, and we were okay. I mean, to, to see what this result really means, it, it I mean, um, it uh, it helps to look at a couple of extreme cases. So if I take my operator t to be, if I take the columns to be an orthonormal basis, then this theorem says that I can find a set of size linear in the dimension which is well conditioned, which is optimal, up to constant. And if I if I have a if I have all the columns be the same, uh, then then the norm of the matrix will be very large. It'll be basically n. And so this result says that I can recover a set of constant size, which is well conditioned. So in some sense, this, this restricted invertibility theorem interpolates between these two extremes. It says that uh, you know, the size of like the, uh, um, basically every oper operator has some, uh, you, can, you can restrict it to, to some subspace on which it's in invertible. Um, and this depends on the norm of, of the operator. Okay? So we were able to recover this theorem with, with the best known constants so far, which is for every epsilon, actually, you can recover a set of size 1 minus epsilon squared n divided by the norm, for which the least singular value is epsilon squared. So there are no hidden constants or anything like that here. And um, uh, the, I mean, it has nice constants, but the proof is also completely elementary and like three pages long, whereas the original proof was technical and quite hard. Um, and uh, I'll give you a rough picture of what kind of, this again done using a single barrier, because we, now we only care about the lower eigenvalue. Essentially what's going on is we start with some barrier, positive barrier, and we show that we can, okay, and, and we, we add a vector without a weight. This adds, we show that it adds an eigenvalue to the right of the barrier, greater than the barrier. And then we show that we can move the barrier backwards in, uh, you know, by an amount that depends on the norm of my operator. Uh, so that some basically the same potential remains bounded, and we show that we can keep doing this. We can keep adding eigenvalues, and since how far back this thing moves depends on the norm, um, uh, we, you know, eventually we we get a bound, uh, we get a lower bound on the eigenvalues, and it turns out to be exactly the right thing. Okay. Um, okay, so that's it for that. I'll end with some open questions. So. Uh, there's a two, there's a off by a factor of two. Is there, is that like, I mean, that comes from Laguerre polynomials. Is there a way to get around that? Um, can we construct unweighted sparsifiers for the complete graph, which are expanders using this method, or for any other families of graphs? Um, is there a way to speed up this algorithm? And then there's the Cadison Singer conjecture. Um, and in general, they're, they're probably, I mean, I think this method, this barrier method, could probably be used to prove a few other results in linear algebra. Which, um, anytime you want a small subset with some spectral properties, it, it might be worth trying. So, okay, that's it. <laughs>